Good evening, everybody, and uh, many thanks to Alberto to give me the opportunity to come to this fantastic country, this big country, enormous country, as I saw it over the plane, to discover you all, to discover this incredible city. So I'm very grateful and honored to be here tonight and today, and um, we'll get straight on. I'm really going to take you on a quick tour of the journey of of my so far, and really started with a coup de foudre, a lightning strike, when I was a young man, and I turned up in Paris and saw this building, which you all recognize very well. And it was a turning point for me because it was a moment at which I realized that architecture, that the city, was not a permanent thing, that it was actually in constant change. I'm looking at it from the perspective of a European city, where things are very stiff and established in those days. This is now about 40 years ago. So looking at this building where single-handedly a change was taking place to the idea of public space, to the idea of a public institution, elitist institution, to the idea about verticality of public spaces, about how you put a building together, every aspect of this building was so radical that it gave me a complete interest in architecture and the idea that we, as architects and professionals with our colleagues, can actually make a difference to the societies that, uh, and bring them forward in, to explore different ways. The fascinating thing of working with Richard, which I did for 20 years, and worked and wrote with him and, and did a lot of what we called extracurricular, non-money-making work, of thinking about things broadly, was this particular pair of slides that he showed me, which was, of course, you'll all recognize Michelangelo. And for me, this was the most unexpected side of Richard's thinking and approach to architecture. The idea that in those days, the medieval city on the left, and then the Renaissance contemporary architects coming, thinking about the space, and weaving it, not just implying a new structure, but actually working with the existing and transforming it into a new aesthetic with new meaning and new social purpose. This contrasted at the same time. I studied and worked through university, through, um, so in and out, in and out, in and out, which gave me an interesting perspective of working for an international architect and then actually starting right at the bottom as an apprentice architect and student. I had a very inspiring tutor, and for those teachers that are here, and for the students, it's an incredible moment, and you must savor every young moment that you have when you're helped to discover your own passions, because those passions stay throughout your life. And this one was, a, um, my tutor had come back from Mexico, and had found a little gray plaque on the side of a building, and it was the Ministry for the Quality of Life. And so our first project was the Department of the Land. And this, the most extraordinary site. We were literally sent there by bus. We arrived on this place, it's down the Thames Estuary in England, away from London towards the sea, a kind of abandoned space. And we had to do something with it. So the program was nothing. We were just put there. And I was joined by Ben Van Berkel of UN Studios at the time, we were all students together. So a bunch, 10 of us, with no idea what we were meant to be doing. I had absolutely no idea, so I decided to build a tent. So I stole a canvas from a building site, made the structure, got a friend to drive me out to the middle of nowhere, and set up this little tent. And boy, was I happy, because it was raining, and I had to stay there all night on my own. So I was very happy with the concept of immediate shelter. And this is all very basic stuff. But the first and most important aspect of our jobs is to provide the protection from the wind, protection from the rain, a shelter. Beneath it, it was really the, the first step of becoming an architect or an artist or thinking about was to try and actually understand overnight what I was feeling in the space and actually trying to take that first step, which I think you'll, you'll all remember, where we actually have to do something of our own. We have to express ourselves through our art. In this case, I can't paint, I still can't paint, but there it was, overnight, painting something, and then arriving back 
taking it all down in the morning and coming back to the Architectural Association and exhibiting the, the event that was happening, that had happened in that night as a two-dimensional exposition of, of what had happened in three dimensions over a period of time. But I think the thing that really carried me was the beauty of the simple object in the landscape and of the sound of the water and of being in nature. And I think that was carried straight through but took a long time to develop into different ways. This is the first project I did when I left uh, Rogers and it is the most beautiful site down in the west of Southern Ireland. And it was for the producer of the mission, actually David Putnam. And he wanted a space in which to think, which is why I call it the think tank, which is sort of a place to think and to to be in nature and to, to focus on it. He was also English in an Irish context. And the site was on a river at the bottom of his garden, but it was at the very private part of his house, but in a public space. So suddenly we had a cultural issue of an Englishman building in an Irish context in a public space, the river, which was frequented by boats and this, that, the other. So there was a dichotomy between how we dealt with it. So the first thing I did was start, was taken up and down the, the, the river by boat, looking at the existing structures that were there over a period of time. And they were generally stone buildings with stone roofs, very protected. And these were the little boathouses that, that dotted along all the, all the way along. And so I started with a sketching process, like we all do, looking at those buildings, thinking about them. And this is 20 years ago, and at the time, a pitch roof was not something that modernists did, especially coming from Richard Rogers' practice. So it was, <laughs> it was a radical piece of cons and conservatism. But we started, started thinking about how one could do, or whether one could produce, a totally modern building, but actually with connections to the vernacular, but to be transferred, to be used as a starting point. The little building that we designed was was, just sits there. It's a, it's a completely glass building, which is given some degree of privacy by some louvers that we introduced, some timber on the outside. It was totally made by a local craftsman who'd never done a precise a building of this sort of nature, but it was a development of a relationship in terms of working with the builder, the local carpenter, and everybody contributed. The notion then, of course, as you do a building, is this idea about how you approach the structure how you make it a building that is inclusive because we recognize it. It's a, it's a typology of building that's very basic and we know what it is. We're already engaged. We're not frightened by it. We're kind of interested because it's a little different and then we approach it. And as we approach it, we start thinking about memories that we all have from going to farmyards of the big heavy doors that you open to go inside and then of the view that is, emerges from it and this incredible ability that architecture has to actually sometimes make the landscape look better when we frame it than when you're standing outside the building. It intensifies the experience of the landscape in a, in a magnificent way. And I try to then also, even a very simple building, on the side is a sort of Japanese pond arrangement that is, the river is actually tidal, it goes up and down. But the little pond on the side is almost like a Japanese, it's a still reflecting pond. But even in a very simple structure, you can make asymmetries with the design so that it opens up differently on one side, even though it's all glass. The materiality of it is incredibly important. The, and also the ability to get out right into the middle of the water, so deep into the river with a, with a little walkway. So again, intensifying this experience of being there. Even if you don't go to the end, you can feel being at the end of it. The selection of materials was the most fundamental thing. And again, I was looking at the time at the, the notion that when we make buildings, when we finish them, we hope that they get better. If you make a very beautiful, crisp, white, perfect building, a week later it's beginning to get a little bit messy. If you use the materials that really, traditional materials basically, this is red cedar, which turns silver very, very quickly and intensifies, and every year I go and see it, it gets richer and richer and richer as it decays. 
So a kind of irony that it's decay, the process of decay actually enriches the structure. But it's such a precise building with very large pieces of glass, stainless steel frames, everything very, very carefully in crafted and bespoke that actually you read it as incredible simple building which belies the amount of effort that we all kind of put into these projects. And then of course the silhouette at night and how it, how it glows like a manger, like uh, Christmas. <laughs> This sort of area, the good thing about doing a building that gets appreciated is that then people ask you to do something else. I was invited on a very mysterious, by a very mysterious client to Russia. And I got flown out to Moscow and then driven for four hours across a flat land of forests. And I kept thinking about Napoleon and his troops retiring through this terrible, endless landscape of nothingness, just silver birch forests on and on and on. And then suddenly, four hours into this very difficult journey across the landscape, we emerged, there was a series of lakes. And the relief that was given by the water and the open, your eye could see out, was, was a kind of a very joyful moment. So we were asked to produce a, a building that was very sparse, that intensified the the, the experience of being in the country. No media room for a Russian, which is quite extraordinary. Very stripped down. In a place, so we made our model to look at, and the notion was how we could work. I worked with Michel Devine, the landscape architect, and we looked at how we would take a meadow into the building, through the building and into the lake, to make it actually part of a, a gateway between the land and the water. And as you can see, also starting to think about how do we interpret a lakeside building in Russia, which has that very great tradition of timber, datchers. And in this case, we try to intensify the experience with a very strong, heavy timber roof sitting on these major columns of fireplaces surrounded by the lightest of lightweight triple glass because the temperature goes down to minus 35 and plus 40. So the, the extremes are incredible. So the idea is to intensify, um, to give you a heaviness of roof, but a lightness and transparency, and a view through, and wherever you are, experiencing the natural process, and then thinking about it in the winter and the whole different seasons. Um, just going forward, just recently in, southern, in, in Spain, in Soto Grande, which is a gated community. So it's a sort of huge holiday resort, 500 or 1,000 houses. The client had bought the whole enterprise and was building a new district and selected seven um, architects from around the world, Brazil, Spain, Holland. My friend Ben Van Berkel from UN Studios is doing one of them. Seven buildings. And we've got the, these, these international architects, as they call us, we're given the best site, which is a hill. And the rest of it's quite, quite um, flat. And we were asked to create, to reinvent the idea of, of holiday living and uh, resort living. And our reaction was to pretend that we weren't in a resort at all and actually try and give the feeling that we were intensely in nature and that the architecture was part of nature and this, that, the other, but not to feel at all the, uh, the sense of being in this, in this resort type environment. Um, this is the hill with, with the mature um, landscape, rather delicate and fantastic pine trees and a range of bushes. And this is the landscape that we had to build. It was a completely difficult site to work on. It's a mountain, obviously, it's a little hill. Um, a very big building of 2,000 square meters is what they wanted. And our notion was to try and integrate it into the hill. This time, thinking about the preserving the key trees on the view, establishing views out across the valley, and inserting the building almost like a hand into the sand, and capturing between the, the open fingers the trees that were there to be protected. This led to the, then the process of containing those spaces, here you can see the four pavilions, containing those in very strong 
walls that sit into the landscape, that we wanted to be made a part of the landscape, like finding an old fortress, an abandoned fortress on a hill. <clears throat> we set the big walls to protect a courtyard and the pavilions and opened it on the other side. And those um, walls were made in, to be made in rammed earth so that we could try and use the, the actual earth itself to color and texturize the, um, the architecture. This, was, this is a couple of views of a, a, a place in Syria where, again, the transition from nature into architecture and then the power of the walls that can be used was something that we were, we were referring to in trying to create this idea of entering into this, the, the hallowed space of this house. This is the courtyard as you enter it, which is a water courtyard with these mud walls around you and with a view through to Gibraltar and other places in the distance. And what's really amazing is that the sea is, you can see Africa from here, and the sea is a silver with the ships on it. It's very beautiful. And then the notion being that we have these pavilions, these very light work, almost classical pavilions, a repeated structure and form, but between them are different terraces patios and gardens, places to eat, places to lounge, with trees growing through them, landscape developing in them. So you pass from inside to outside. When we do these sort of structures, and similar to the, the previous project, we start thinking about how we make a kit of parts, because that seems to be the way of creating the real quality that we're trying to get out of these, these buildings. So here is a, we're using here a precast concrete solution for the structure of the beams and the columns the beams and columns of the, the pavilion upstairs, and then also thinking about downstairs, a very solid construction. So above are the living areas, and below are the bedroom areas. Above is just a open, using blinds and enjoying the views. And then downstairs, taking from the caves of Matera, where people live quite deep in it. So the places where your bedrooms are, are you're quite recessed in it. The light is out, the light and heat, you're away from the light and heat, and you create the kit of parts there makes up this cave-like structure where you use the thermal mass to cool as much as possible, you keep the sun out, you keep the temperature, you use the ground temperature of the, gra of the, uh, the soil. And then, most importantly, the social areas, the pool, or this, that, the other, and looking again at organic shapes where people go to naturally, rather than, let us say, the very orthogonal, beautiful, straight lines of things, sometimes we need to actually soften it, get into the forms of nature so that, that people go to them naturally and enjoy them and fluctuate around them. The whole process that we all do the whole time is we're given kind of unpromising sights always. And our great joy, I think, is when we finally work out what we're meant to do with them. This is, this is a, a terrace in London, in a very good part of London, but there'd been bomb damage in the Second World War, and they'd built a, a terrace, a, a sort of bad Bauhaus terrace, that, uh, in a sort of English modernist style, made in concrete and bricks. Very solid, very inflexible, and in a, with a social hierarchy, with the kitchen and staff room on the, on the ground, a very uninviting garden at the back. The facades don't look very different front and back. The articulation is, is, uh, is difficult. And people have started trying to decorate them with, with little shutters and cornices. And we decided with the client that we would actually take the thing and actually make it more Bauhaus than even the architects in the 50s had, were able to do. So here we are, this is the back of the building. We've taken out volumes inside, we've introduced a staircase, we've put the kitchen down in the, in the, uh, the ground floor, we've reorganized the garden to it, we've created a pavilion, a, a new terrace, a double height studio for the painter, and then a, another studio on the side. And it's a series of manipulations where the front restore the idea of the black frame windows, which has now been copied by all the others along the terrace. So gradually it influences how they're thinking about things. And at the back, introduce a completely Baroque garden in relationship to this thing. So this is not restoration, this is transformation, but hopefully with some respect to the initial kind of structure of the building. 
Here, we, I work with a fabulous landscape architect, Todd Longstaff Gowan, who does all sorts of things, but I particularly like the relationship of his Baroque, very voluptuous landscape with our architecture, which is more formal. Here, we've introduced a staircase, which is like a serrated sculpture that goes all the way up the building. The kitchen, as you enter, you discover at the back this incredible garden beyond. And we've kind of created a proscenium arch arrangement so that the kitchen looks straight out into the garden. We haven't got a patio in front of it. We've got the garden right up to the window, so you're in the garden. And just delight in the sculpture of the, of the, the landscape. We tend to provide spaces, and they're quite anonymous sometimes, they, you know, they have good proportions, they're strong, but actually what I enjoy more than anything is to allow, is to give the opportunity for the client with their tastes, with their little, their possessions, the way that they like to use it, the way they structure it, to, to give them the freedom to actually get in the building and make it theirs and to take over from us. So we give them the framework and the bones and we hope that the client really then transform it. This is a project <clears throat> in Chelsea. This is a very, London has experienced an incredible growth in property values, and housing in Chelsea is one of the top values in the world. And this project is an old school project, which you can see in the top left, which was then moved on, and a property, my client bought it and has built, is building an incredible for billionaire type houses. Now we've got two houses in the playground that we're building. And this one I'm showing you today is the one at the end of the street, which is a street of um, artist studios from the 19th century. So 19th century, early 20th century. Each one is different. I'm afraid the picture of me is obliterating the one on the left, but these are all um, very particular and very unusual for that part of London, because each one is different. Each one was an artist using quite an interesting contemporary architect at the time. And the feeling was to try and see how we could then com complete that view with something that drew you to the end of that view, that complemented the whole street, that sort of made sense of that, com that completion. So we, the key thing was to try and pull out an element from the left, which if you got rid of the picture of me, we could see it, but maybe we can't. And introduce a studio-like window facing the street. Very simple act, but trying to put one simple window which connected to everything else in that street on a blank facade. This is actually the state of what we're doing in London now. It's a, we're building icebergs everywhere because of the value of the land and, the, and because of the protection. So you can't go up, so people go down and down and down. And that gives you a little idea of the type of structure that is happening at the top end of the market. In the section, you can see the idea of, again, creating a type of salon, drawing room, artist studio type space in the top left. And then down the bottom, you've got the swimming pool and you've got borrowed light that's coming through down into courtyard into a lower courtyard for additional bedrooms quite a small site very tight site but where we want trying to keep the um the landscape rolling through can we can we get rid of the picture of me thanks great so that you can see the the, the idea of using the ground plane for the just to see straight through and above creating a series of different elements and most importantly, trying to keep to the scale of the existing street, because all the artist studios are really quite small. So here we try to break up the form of this building, even just the top part, into several forms. And then, and then trying to then begin to articulate the building, and how do you, you know, how do you actually work a building? And I was very intrigued by the idea of trying to create an almost a Venetian facade, a highly decorated, decorated facade using the material. So just using the material instead of trying to rationalize it and make it very um, perfect, in the end, actually try and make it very rich. This is the, the salon, the main hall, which we anticipate people will be giving, I suppose, enormous parties, overlooking the space with a big window that opens up to make it into a, 
a type of uh, portico, a, a type of um, balcony area. The, the big glass facade has shutters that open, louvers that then cast interesting shadows. This is it, They're just finishing the building now, and this is this big, giant guillotine window that opens up so that you can enjoy it in the, in the space. You can enjoy the garden from outside. But one of the great things is that it gives you the opportunity to start working again with amazing craftsmen. Now, this was um, a visit to down in Tivoli to, get to, to buy the travertine. And there, I'm working with a man whose father, great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, effectively the same travertine that built the Colosseum. And working with them and working out how you cut the stone in order to create a very, very wild effect. So what we've actually got, not a terribly good slide, but trying to get this feeling of handcrafted walls that you might have seen in Rome, where by cutting it as a cross cut, you get a wild marbling pattern. Each one is a decorative element. And then putting that together to counterbalance the, the simplicity and rigidity of the main struck, of the main just flat wall. And then the articulation of all the different elements, bringing them together in a very crisp bronze and, uh, and, and travertine. And again, the landscape at the ground always creating an in and out experience throughout the house. This is a completely different type of, um, of endeavor, and I'm sure some of you have done this sort of work as well. Here we're, we're dealing with, I got a call from um, Richard Rogers, at my old boss, and saying, could I help out with, a little pro with his building that he built in 1968? And this building, curiously, which looks a terrible mess, is actually one of the most protected buildings. It's the top 5% of the protected buildings in Britain. So it's one of the most important modernist structures in Britain today. Fortunately, the authorities don't know how to conserve a modern building. They know how to conserve a 19th century building, a 17th century building, even a 12th century building. But a 20th century building, they really struggle. They're not quite sure what you're meant to do. Um, the handcraft is not as important as it is in a 16th century building, so they're a bit lost. So that gave us a certain amount of freedom. This was the building that was actually in 1968, built for his parents. And it's a, a prototype for industrialized housing. It's a perfect space for his retired parents. It's a flexible space on the inside. It's expandable or contractible. It's his it's an iconic building for him, and it's a prototypical in his work, where it's very clear expression of the structure, very clear expression of internal spaces, without really rooms, more the idea that with sliding screens that re reveal different rooms, you change and manipulate the structure. For me, seeing this picture and knowing that it's 50 years old puts all our work today into question in terms of just how visionary some of these architects were at that time. But having gone back to a stage where it was fairly degraded, we had to take a radical look at every part of the building. In the end, we had to rebuild 75% of it in modern materials, in meeting code with a new garden, and the process was one of... So this is a picture of him and his mother in 1967 on this site. And as we pull the building apart to look at it, we realized that it was not just a prototype, but it was an experimental building. So he persuaded his parents to build one of his early projects. I think everybody's tried that one. And if it went wrong, he built it again. So when we took the roof to bits to have a look at it, it had all sorts of funny steelwork in it. The whole building is actually, it's a protected building, but it's actually a prototype, not the real thing. It's a step towards it. And part of the historical interest is the fact that it has mistakes in it, that we've had to mark and explain how we've rectified it, where the new interventions are, so that there's a record of the history of this building, almost like doing archaeology. This, again, if you could get rid of the picture of me, that would be great. So this, some of our work, nobody ever understands what the hell we're doing. This particular one shows you a sequence from 1968 to what we proposed in 2017. 
If you blink, you won't notice a difference between any of them. But actually, through a process of time, there was an erosion of the original an erosion and a change. The cars, the carport went, turned into a, a place for some um, for people to live, to share with the parents. A building was constructed at the back when when somebody moved in who had a big family needed another building, and in the end together with the landscape architect, which is a very important component of this building because it is a series of glass walls in a direction. And across the road is, the, is a huge park. And the idea was that there was a flow of space that goes, ends up in, in the park across. But again, quite radical, at the bottom is actually, this is, this, is, this is in Wimbledon where the tennis goes on. About, the tennis goes on about a kilometer away. And there's a long road by the side of a park and it's filled with mock Elizabethan buildings, sort of mock 16th century buildings, big, brusque, sort of 20th century pretend buildings. And then suddenly, Richard built a mound of earth and planted plants on it and hid these two bungalows behind it. So it was, very, again, a very radical statement. And the garden was an incredibly important part. This is us pulling the thing to pieces and then slowly putting back in the lighting system, putting back in, it had a heated ceiling system, which was very, they thought was a brilliant idea at the time. There was no insulation, which we need. So we went through a process of actually pulling it to pieces and reconstructing it, but trying to keep as much as possible within the, the, the language of the existing building. Here you just see the transformation going from the early, um, the first design, how it's changed in the second design, and then how we developed into the third design. It's pretty much archaeology and reinvention. And this is the building used now by Harvard for a fellowship program, where there are two fellows at any one time. We had to convert the small building to make it two, two bedrooms, two bathrooms, and then reconstruct the whole building. The main thing is the, the transparency through the inner courtyard, the series of different spaces, a space with, uh, with a tree followed by the courtyard, followed by, uh, that's furnished by Ernesto Rogers. This is an additional bathroom that we did in the same spirit of the first bathroom, the first bathroom I've ever been into back when I first went to it, which had a completely glass ceiling in, as a surprise in the middle of, uh, of, this, of this house. And then the sliding screens you can see disappearing, allowing maximum movement. And in fact, it's one of the most immaterial buildings that I've seen, where you're not sure if you're in or out, the thing flows from one space to the other. It's an amazing monastic experience. And this is Ricky Burdetta, you might know, talking to somebody from Harvard, discussing as part of a Harvard program about cities. So they invite ideas for fellows. And this was Richard's ideas, to give the building get it restored and have it as an iconic building in terms of his work, but then a place where people continue to discuss architecture and cities and invite people to use it going forward. Moving on into more the public realm. This is um, a commercial venture. You'll see, you'll all recognize the enormous building on the top, a massive previous power station. Now this is opposite um, back in 2000 still, there was very little development on the south of the River Thames. So in London, it's split pretty much east-west by the Thames, which wiggles around. And opposite St. Paul's and the financial district, the most expensive real estate in London, commercial real estate, opposite was this power station. And as you all know, Herzog de Moron converted it into the Tate Modern, the most important um, Museum of Contemporary Art, or 20th Century and Contemporary Art in Britain, um, several million visitors a year, accessed from the left-hand side, of, uh, from the, sorry, the right-hand side of this picture of the building. And by fortune, we were involved, we were selected to look at this little tiny site, which was a paper mill, which is on the right-hand side of the big, of the museum up here. Oh, look. So it's roughly there. And that is where the entrance to the, the ramped fa famous turbine hall, I don't know if you know, but at the back of it, there's a huge space that Anish Kapoor and people have done sculptures in. 
amazing, Olufsen did this amazing um, sunset scene in it, the biggest hall you can imagine, it's industrial. But this is the main ramp here into the building, the main access, and facing us was the site that we were asked to look at. It was an old printing work, so it was a paper warehouse, and it did, the person had died and it was up for auction, and we were asked to look at what to do with this site. The purpose of the Tate Modern getting receiving public funds was that it was going to revitalize all the area to the south. So an area that had been completely ignored for, for decades. It was a Pope kind of industrial area, but so close to the financial sector. Um, Norman Foster was asked to build the bridge, which opened around 2000 and famously wobbled quite a lot, if you remember. And we worked with the engineer who made the wobbling bridge and started developing ideas. Now, we, the starting point was, this is the, at the bottom here is the, the entrance to the tur Tate Turbine, the famous ramp into this huge space. We'll, I'll show it to you a bit later. And this is our site dotted in red around here. So it's a tiny site. And what we looked at is the flow of movement from the station, where people were coming from, how they actually might enter into it, and whether some of our tiny site could be given back to public space in order to facilitate the, the easier movement into it. So this is the developed uh, master plan for it, trying to generate um, an active space between this little building and the side of the Tate. One of the things that the planners were very concerned about is that museums tend to freeze the area around them. So they were very keen on our project that tried to revitalize or vitalize the area between it. Then we started thinking about what we do with it now vertically and looking at the structure, looking at the place. The, the tape was not a listed building, it's not a protected building. There was nothing protected around it and it was a redevelopment, regeneration area. So we thought that we could either take the attitude of just building up with a six-story, eight-story building with a big shadow, or maybe we could build something very, very fine, very, very tall, and then we started thinking about, can we relate this to something? Does it relate to something? Is there something natural on the site that we were able to relate it to? And in this case, we literally took the, the, uh, the, the diagram, the, the, the picture of the the Herzog scheme, and wondered whether we could actually produce a building that was as narrow as the chimney of the Tate Modern, and as tall as the chimney of the Tate Modern, as a beacon at the entrance of the, the ramp into the, um, into the Tate Modern. So we pursued that, and if you could get rid of me again. <laughs> yeah, good. So that gives you an idea of the space. The actual space of the Tate Modern, I don't know how, I don't know how many of you have visited it, but it's an enormous space. And our building is roughly, is, could fit into it sideways, into it quite comfortably. And the notion was, maybe here, in London that is very conservative about tall buildings, although the program has changed completely in the last 10 years where there are now lots and lots of tall buildings around, we wondered whether if we could do this very slender tall building, it would be enough to actually justify its important position. So that... It, it could be stunning enough through its proportions and, 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 I guess, design. The other thing was that with the movement, with the giving more of the site away, and now going very vertically, and thinking about where people were coming, particularly from the station, we started thinking of how that chimney could be enhanced, how, in terms of urban design, we could start now framing views between one pocket space towards the Tate itself to, to in, intensify the experience of the city. The, the plan was totally repetitive. The idea was I'd detail up something marvelous on one floor and then just repeat it 32 times. It was, um, it was successful in terms of the fact that it was on a north-south axis, which meant the shadowing was very good. And also for the prevailing winds, it had very minimum turbulence because of the shape and the curved ends and the, and the orientation. We explore all our buildings in real models to just to try out the proportions, to look at them, to live with them, to have them around the office, to p continuously see it. The rear of the building, which is actually facing the sun, has got gardens louvered by, protected with a brie soleil. The north, open to the view of St. Paul's, 
is fully glazed with small terraces on the side. The building is extremely tall and slender, and it has what we call outriggers, which you can see the clamps. The clamp, the building is clamped back to the core in a way that they use on sailing masts, which actually stiffens this very tall, thin structure. That then becomes, obviously, the architecture. It gives the, op the engineer gives us the opportunity to design the architecture of the building. And there you see it in relationship down the river. There now is a building next to it, which is twice or three times the size. Because this building looks like an enormous building, but it's actually quite small. And then thinking about the sustainability aspects of it, which I haven't spoken about, but underpins everything that we try to do. Here, we're using the Thames water as a cooling method for the internal. We're using the slabs um, and shading the facades, etc. Just moving on now to a public project. Again, this is in Marylebone, and this is a state school for girls. There are 900 girls in these assembly of buildings. It's on the street, but has no presence. It's a mixture of architectural styles. And again, one's trying to think about how we can perhaps start knitting it together. In this particular case, the headmistress wanted a very large performing arts center. And the notion was they were going to build it in the space between the buildings on this rather wet car park playing field. And that was their only hope to actually keep the school in the city center. So all of us here would go, we probably can't build it in the courtyard. So we probably need to build it under the courtyard. So for us, I think that's a pretty obvious move. And they thought I was an absolute genius for, for thinking this up because clearly it couldn't go above. So what we in fact did was proposed a five-story building with the performing art, the big gymnasium, the dance studios below ground, access from an open, an open courtyard. Of course, what we didn't know is that um, it was a, a cemetery and a plague pit. And here on the first day of construction is a lady who I think was coming somewhere to Latin America that afternoon, who was the world expert on plague. And she was checking whether who could go on site, who had smallpox vaccinations. And here we were, our introduction to the builders on the first day of our start off meeting with them. So we ended up with a massive excavation. This is after the exhumation of the three and a half thousand. It was a very fashionable cemetery in the 18th century where artists, George Stubbs, very famous painters, sculptures, architects, boxers, it was the place to be buried in London. And 25% of the site was excavated by archaeologists and 75% by exhumation people. And the process is incredibly interesting what they found. It was a church school, so they told me, it's OK, we won't be spooked, it's fine. Everybody is, uh, there's nothing there. The souls have all departed. This is the space now nine meters below ground. So the engine room of the project, the environmental engine room, is pretty much the courtyard. So it's a, very, it's a small courtyard, seven meters wide, but about eight meters deep, and a long strip. And that underpins the downstairs. There you can see in the morning the sun comes all the way into the space. Um, the structure again is very organized in a very um, hierarchic way. The architecture down here was effectively using, this is a state project which has very little money. So we, the money that we used was the civil engineering budget. So we used uninsulated walls around it in order to give a constant temperature throughout the year using techniques that they've used in Iran for thousands of years where they move into the, their, their summer quarters are below ground with a very temperate environment, same thing with a lot of structures in Latin America as well. And here with shutters that open up, so you have complete um, ventilation, it's like being in an open recreation thing. But it's the quality of light that you get through, borrowed, borrowed to, to carry on. <clears throat> the notion on the ground level was to begin to try and knit all these different spaces together and to create ramps and things for people to enter because there, there wasn't a single disabled child in the school because there was not one level threshold. 
and then to try and link that back to the street in a series of spaces. This is the reconstructed um, courtyard. We've got rid of the cars, and now it's a playing field where the girls use it, and then establishing this kind of clock tower, which is just an elevator, emphasizing the way down into the lower space to make it a, a, a theatrical event with a very theatrical staircase, using a covering made out of PTFE, the, the, the pillows of uh, plastic pillows rather than glass. Um, in every way, looking at different materials that we could use from industrial use of glass, um, industrial wiring that we used that off, to give it a, a feeling that it was incredibly custom made, incredibly customly woven together, but actually using industrialized units. Here is the, the downstairs space with the shutters that are going up. And then again, wonderful opportunity to use all sorts of different types of materials to experiment with them. Most important for us, as we always, we need to do it so that we can do it again and then we can learn from each one. This is <coughs> CLT, CLT roof, the, the timber roof which went up in a single day, <coughs> made out of panels six meters by two meters and about 15 centimeters deep, spanning six meters. The structure goes up in a day. Core 10 on the facades, inside the gymnasium to give acoustic, um, to dampen acoustics. We used wire trays, cable trays, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, as a very, again, very bespoke looking piece. And inside we had a lot of ladies in Bradford sewing duvets for us in a fire retardant material. So slightly silvery, literally duvets stuck in cable trays. And then in the end, of course, the joy is to watch the, um, the girls using the space. And in the end, we're giving people just a background where they can articulate what they're doing. They have a sense that they are being treated properly as not quite adults, but as proper citizens. And they, they take to it incredibly well. And then linking back to the street where even the elevator there begins to try and connect back to the urban space. So you have a sense that the, the little memorial garden in front becomes part, is anchored by the tower of the building, which anchors the playground, which then turns around. So trying to articulate the urban spaces around it. It's all very small scale work, but trying to knit together the city through one little intervention at a time. This very different scale, this is, we're now in Dublin, the, the heart of I mean, unbelievably, we all know the great books, Irish books. This particular area called Dunleary is where very famous authors lived. So reading, the, the, the word, is an incredibly important thing. The project was for a, for a library on a site. And, oops, and this is the site here. And it sits on this, posi this position here. And that's it. And what it was, was it in the... In the main periods of immigration in the 19th century and early 20th century, the people coming from Ireland to England would take a steamship from here, and this pond, this is an oval pond, which is located here, was where the water was for the steamships. So this is a very symbolic place of departure of immigration from Ireland for thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. And this site was given partly for a park and partly for a library. And I wasn't very inclined to build a building on it. And I think that sometimes, I don't know about all of you, but sometimes one kind of goes, do we really want a building in this place? Because you, I'll show you in a minute, but there's a, there's a church here. There are spires around. It's open to the sea. There's a fantastic place here that everybody goes and, I think, looks out romantically at the view. There's a change of level of five meters between the the top and the bottom. And then there's a disused pier waiting for development. And then in this extraordinary way here is that you have a sort of linear park which walks, goes all the way across the causeway which allows you to then to look back at the site and look back at, the, at Dublin and people walk out on that thing and it's that incredible, you're kind of in the sea walking out for miles. So our notion was to see whether really we could organize the territory so that the building is an absolutely minimal part, but actually try and bring the, the coastal landscape 
into the site and actually embed the building's formation of um, the building, basically landscape formation, where we had an exhibition, a small exhibition hall here, and the, the main library under a great golden dome here. Using the, the top of the area as a, a park with reeds, a water park with reeds, with species from the coastal species. And the notion was that the wall, the terraces on the outside would change color through the year, so it would basically be a great rock with a, with a dome within it. Again, using the experience that one gets from the previous project, trying to limit the amount of energy use. Here we have an ETFE roof again, a great golden structure that sits over the top. The air is introduced, it, we're using an embedded concrete structure. The air is introduced on the sides here through tunnels. So a natural system of air movement, minimal cooling, minimum humidification control, <clears throat> and the street between the two, allowing the steeple of the church to rise above it, but still to have <clears throat> a strong presence. This is a breakdown of the, the areas. The oval shape has a great historical references, but also gives an opportunity to people to have a series of small spaces around one big space, where the circulation has to be the middle, which means you have to meet people, you have to bump into somebody in, on, the, on the central aisle. Yet you've got your privacy and you're part of a community. Then extending that route, which starts at the high street, the commercial street of the, of the, of the town here, through the building and then potentially onto the pier, which then becomes an extension of this, this route out. And then when we go out on the causeway and look back, there's a symbol of this liter literature, this great literature that is at the heart of their community and their culture. I'm now moving on to a collaboration with Shiguru Ban, which was enormously good fun. This is, again, an opportunity where the clients, where the architect is asked properly to invent. So here, we're, there's no question about it. There's nothing on the site that one can really relate to. And we're being basically asked to invent. Now, there is so much invention of new towns today, so much around the world. It's got to be the hardest thing. And we're doing it. Commercial people are doing it. They're building and building and building. And it's, it's, it's the hardest thing. Here, we've got pretty much nothing. It used to be a festival area where there would be big international um, industrial fests. And so there was an international competition. Shiguru had been selected. He asked me to collaborate with him. And the initial ideas were to do with a Chinese hat that he rather liked and a picture of Pompidou done by Vasarelli, which famously had the hexagonal symbol of France. France sits into a hexagon. And this was our kind of starting point. Something to do with this, which then eventually, through lots of discussion, we had a very interesting team. So lots of discussions eventually became a top big roof over a series of tubes that contained the main program of the uh, of the exhibition. I brought in Michel Devine, the landscape architect, and we worked on how the city could come and integrate itself into and under this huge tent. So actually bringing people straight into the building itself, introducing water features on the outside that could be ice skating in the, in the winter, so that the public space and the, ex the art world was actually inhabiting the entire site. We eventually honed the structure, pulled elements down, which you now see very regularly in, in Shiguru's work, a complex wavy structure sitting over these main tubes. You enter, you go down a ramp, rather like at the Tate, with these structures soaring above you, the water on the side, trying to create an art park. This was the competition model, where you begin to have these things poking through. We related each tube to, although we were on the wrong side of the tracks, so we were outside the main city, outside the medieval city, and they'd built a 19th century railway track right the way through. You can see all the tracks there. So we're definitely outside the main city. And one of the issues was, how can we make it feel part of it? 
So the tubes, which contained the, the program, which was very specific, very French, very rational, what they wanted, each space had to be the same, one dimension always had to be the same. So we took that one and then put them together like a long sausage. Three of them contained the entire brief and then pointed them at some major symbols of the city. This is our competition drawing, where the actual galleries were controlled environmentally, but nothing else was. The big tent was pretty much naturally ventilated, open, using some of the, the, the um, reject heat in the winter to warm the space and the reject cooling the heat to cool it in the summer, and then pointing these great tubes of gallery space out to the, the cathedral in the distance. This was the first rendering, the idea of how it worked. And then Chiguru went off in his fantastic way to solve the problem of the roof, which Arup, who's the biggest engineers in, in England, couldn't do. But a, a, a single German, a Swiss engineer, Hermann, resolved the problem of incredible simplicity with a layer, three layers, not woven, but interwoven with a simple joint, fle a simple flexible timber joint, which was quite a remarkable solution to the problem of this huge spanning structure. This is it with the, the covering going on it through construction. This is it on the opening, just before the opening day. This is it at night. And then these great tubes, which then look out to the cathedral and draw the city of the cathedral right into the heart of the building. I wanted to talk a tiny bit about uh, the, the great experience of working with Richard was the opportunity to start thinking much broader than the brief that we're given, but than the program that we're given by our clients. But actually starting to think about things as broadly as possible. There's a great tradition, of course, of architects looking beyond what they're actually doing. In this particular case, and this is my first architectural work, in the sense, was the installation of the exhibition, but we worked on this master planning. It was an exhibition of Foster's, Rogers and Sterling, James Sterling in the Royal Academy in London. And Richard decided not to spend any money on the installation, but to spend it all on a project for London. And the project was entirely about public space. This is about 1986. And it was to do with making a new bridge across the Thames. And it was about pedestrianizing Trafalgar Square. And it was about making links and parks and this, that, the other. And interestingly, most of those things have been done, but not by Richard. So the, uh, the value of doing these things is amazing because even if you put the ideas out there, they, they gather momentum, they gather strength, people develop on them. It's never wasted effort. We also wrote um, the, um, the, the BBC Wreath Lectures. Every year they ask for um, an artist, a lawyer, a politician, a thinker, a philosopher. This time it was an architect we were asked to do five lectures on architecture, and we used it as an opportunity to research the idea of the environmental crisis and social crisis, this is back in the 90s, and looking at whether we could actually make a, a, a look at how the city, was. we, be, we believe that the city was fundamental to the, pro, the environmental crisis in terms of the footprint that the cities create, but also the social problems that we're generating and the growth of cities. So we actually tried to put city design firmly and architecture firmly at the heart of solving the environmental and social crisis. And whilst we, our research was not numerous pioneering research, we brought together a lot of thoughts and then presented it to four million people over the radio on a series of evenings. I was asked to, one of the first projects we did was working with another friend, Shiguru um, with, well, Shigura helped us actually, but with uh, Stephen Spence, who worked with a little bit with Craig, who's going to talk this afternoon. And Britain was building a, the dome, which you might have heard of, which to celebrate the year 2000. There were 12 pavilions inside. We were asked to design one of the pavilions. Zaha Hadid did one, Nigel Coates did another, um, all sorts of different people did it. It was of, of very patchy quality, as it turned out, but very interesting. I was given the community pavilion. 
So this is somehow a community of Great Britain, somehow, that I was meant to connect with and make some sort of develop some sort of relationship with them or something that could be called some sort of community effort. And we had this, this is a TV program, it's called Blue Peter. There are, there's a sign here that every child in Britain wanted to win. You win a badge with Blue Peter on it if you've done something good. And all of us had spent our entire lives, including all our parents, for 50 years collecting things that we'd send off to Africa or to India to save somebody here, raise money for this, make something there. There was always a program. And I thought the best way to connect to people was through the children of, of the UK. And in this case, we designed a structure and then we asked Blue Peter to do an appeal across the country on television. And it went out and we got, and the notion was we asked the children of Britain to give us five bits of cardboard that they cut out of a cereal packet to stick it together, to put their names on one side and to put the name of a paper mill on the other side and to send it in. And the first 25,000 children, or the first 25,000 we received, their names would be put on the building as the benefactors of the building. So every other zone, every other pavilion in the dome was su supported by a commercial sponsor, but ours was supported by the children's donations, which they could send in with a second class postage stamp, whether they lived in the north, or the south, the east, the west, miles away in the city, whatever it is. Everybody just needed a little stamp to send it in. And that produced, when, meanwhile we were working with, uh, and Chiguru helped us with his paper technology, on a, a spiral structure with columns, 100 columns going from 10 meters to 100 meters high, uh, to 20 meters high approximately 40 centimeters in diameter. Um, interesting technology to do with the, uh, the, the walls. Each cardboard tube was made in a different way, depending on what kind of performance we wanted out of it, whether it was stiffness, fire protection, or flexibility to do the ones on the outside. So we could tune the way that they were manufactured to perform. The actual exhibition comprised three main elements the idea of a person, an individual, and their, their personal space, which are the cubes on the first floor, which we work with artist Richard Wilson to lay out. An experience of the seven ages of man, looking at how people related to their, their physical space, working with artists like Eduardo Palozzi and, and young art, a range of different artists. Going into a second space, which was a street around the outside here, where we were working with the cardboard theatre company, who would actually do things in the, as people walk through it, which brought the community together to give the idea as the neighbor, the neighbor and the street. And then the f last space down here, which was a huge model of a city, and it was the 24-hour cycle of a sustainable city portrayed in seven minutes with, no, with lots of monitors with scenes taken around Britain but made into this dream city of the future with no figure larger than 100 millimeters so that the children could think that they might have been to Lilliput and learned about the future of the of, of this city. This is the structure. We developed an architectonic hierarchy of elements specifically for it, another kit of parts to, out of which we could make the building to give it a kind of classical, again, hierarchy, how the elements went together. This is under fabrication and prototyping. 32 layers of, of paper for each tube, roughly. Um, this colonnade, the street, the building in the, in the uh, chaos of the, of the dome, <laughs> this huge structure. And at the end of the process, we asked that the paper would taken again, the columns was dismantled, we sent it back to the paper mill and we made paper, and out of that paper we made a book, and, which included a small book the same size as the CD covers, that had within it a kit of elements that the children could actually make a model of the building that it was made out of to keep us kind of cycle. And mainly to try, the whole project in many ways was about trying to connect the idea of architecture, engineering, the idea of imagination and transformation and sustainability and recycling to people because most people have very little contact with architects until they're quite old. So the idea here was to actually work with the schools around Britain to actually get ideas about 
how architecture can transform, reuse, recycle, and be exciting. This is, um, we were, last year we were selected to, to um, exhibit at the Venice Biennale, which is a huge honor, and we thought we would use the opportunity for a new project. So rather than to exhibit anything we'd done, is to actually start afresh from a new pro project and use the platform of the exhibition to promote it. So the, there's a little, there are two little films, they're only two minutes each, and I'll take you through them in a second. But just in broad, this is a project through Armenia. There's an Englishman who's building a trail across, and the basic proposition is to change that, to take that piece of walking infrastructure and to develop it into something that could create a cultural renaissance, especially for the young and especially for the people in the mountains who are, who are alienated from this change that this post-Soviet country is going through into becoming a more commercial, westernized place. But to see whether a new kind of cultural development could happen in the mountains. Here, I was particularly interested in this, sort of, this the, the map of the, oh, the map because it showed the landscape of the Caucasus as not being divided between countries but a place divided with people living in different valleys around the place. So a shared geography with people living in different places and some of the stunning sites and incredible architecture of, of the place. This is the little film which I think you need to press the button. The 750 kilometre trail is emerging from south to the north of Armenia, conceived, initiated, and built by volunteers. <laughs> Our proposal is to initiate a grand projet of small scale collaborations, to apply an architect's eye, to scout for opportunity sites along the route that crosses a landscape of rich geological variety, renowned heritage and astounding beauty. The route transforms the situation for the mountain communities, providing new markets that can regenerate their livelihoods. It brings an engaged tourists that plays to the strengths of local hospitality. Walkers, families and enthusiasts, sensitive to the landscape they are traversing, more open to the local communities than the packaged tourists bust from site to hotel in hermetic isolation. We start on the first completed phase of the route in the Dilijan National Park, and at the Biennale present five pilot collaborations. Refugees designed and assembled by student workshops within random environments. A spectacular rope bridge strung across a gorge like a giant spider's web. Far with water tools. Amphitheatre on a magnificent hillside. Ecological interventions within the lake. Tree houses. All projects that sit on the ground lightly, that engage with the landscape, that involve the community. These projects will create milestones along the route, destinations to aim for, places to wander at the landscape. Venues and festivals of music, food, and community, and with time will become an internationally recognized linear festival comparable to the great pilgrimage groups. So, here are just a couple of the projects going through working with landscape, integrating them into this amazing waterfall area, looking at ecological issues because, of course, it's a post-Soviet country. The landscape is of actually little value to them. So trying to introduce man and landscape with, without just ruining the edges of, of lakes and actually integrating them together is something that we're trying to bring up. This is this bridge that we've done with Matthew Wells of Technica, uh, which spans through this incredible gorge. We've done a counterintuitive type structure within it. And this was the exhibition in uh, the Biennale itself. And I have a small last film to go with it, which we'll end on. These are the exhibits. 
And this is what we really refer to as the first intervention of this project. So this itself is our site-specific approach to the project. So we'll end with this film. You can't do it. Oh, you've done it. You can't do it. The Free Space Exhibition in the beautiful Coppelia has provided the opportunity to realize the first intervention. The installation is therefore a demonstration of our manifesto and attitude to place. The little chapel that we've created contains five monolithic pens encircled by an immaterial undulating landscape. The plinths are made of earth rammed in reusable formwork. The material is locally sourced limestone, sand and coloured powdered clays. <coughs> Working with local craftsmen, the team have manually rammed the earth to form the solid bases for the architectural propositions. Finished plinths resemble geologists' core samples, extracts from the earth. Their textures, colours and markings echo and harmonise with the 13th century columns of the Caldera. The model landscapes are carved into a monoblock of honeycomb cardboard, suggestive of the geological strata of the mountains. They form the allegorical, rugged background of the delicate interventions that are crafted in glimmering brass and their contrast and delight. And when the exhibition is over, these plants are offered back to Venice as planters for pomegranate trees, the symbol of Armenia and of its historic ties we laugh, Serenissima. Thank you very much.